Um, so, all right, so I'm going to talk about uh, Napari, which uh, lets you view, annotate, and analyze multidimensional images. Um, and they can be any images. The thing on the screen is actually a simulation of galaxy formation. Um, so from the, the YT people. Um, so a bit of background. Um, between 2009 and 2018, there was really not a lot of uh, good tools to view multidimensional data in Python. Um, so that's a paper of mine. Uh, I, I was using Python for segmentation and stuff um, because there were a lot of really great tools, NumPy, um, scikit-image, scikit-learn. Um, and so I was doing like machine learning segmentation and stuff. And you could write anything, but to display this, um, I actually plotted segmentations in two dimensions in Matplotlib. That's the three panels that you see there. Um, and then I um, rendered the 3D neurons that you're seeing um, in a different software package called ITK Snap, and then I overlaid them in Illustrator. Um, so they're the kind of hoops that we were um, jumping uh, back in 2010 to, to try to look at 3D data in Python. Um, so it, it was very clunky. You had to like export your data, open it in something else, and so on. Um, and I, I just kept wanting for a solution. And um, there's there's a lot of smart people working in Python, so it was a bit weird. And then I came up with this thread in um, the Python MNE. Uh, I forget what that. Anyway, it's an electron uh, neuron electrode um, package. Um, can you guys see, or is the zoom thing in the middle for you? Tobias, or I can't hear anyone. Anyway, so uh, Gail Valico is one of the founders of Scikit-Learn. Uh, yeah, it was good. OK. Um, it's like my Zoom video is in the way, but that's fine. Um, yeah, so he's one of the founders of Scikit-Learn. And he says, I've given up on this uh, 3D visualization. I see it as a huge loss of time, and I think it's only a toy. Um, and because we can't fund it, it must mean that it's not mission critical. Um, so that was really discouraging. Uh, this is 2016. Um, but I really don't think that 3D visualization is a toy any more than 2D visualization is a toy. And 2D visualization, I think everyone uh, agrees, is extremely useful. And if your data is 3D, well, 3D visualization is, uh, makes more sense. Um, and I think I uh, was just frustrated about not being able to get support for this thing. Um, but in 2018, um, I went to uh, Berkeley to um, work on second image. I was working on second image at the time, and there was an expert sprint. So there's some uh, very Python famous people there. Uh, that's Matt Rocklin in the background. Uh, he's the creator of Dask. Um, Kira Evans, who's at CCI. John Kirkham, who's now at NVIDIA. Um, and Emmanuel Larocco, who's uh, a professor in France. Um, so we're working on second image. Um, I still sort of had no plans to make a 3D viewer. Um, but then I met with Loic, who uh, was an old friend from Janelia. Um, and he was from the Fiji and Java world. And he had done a really cool software for Java called uh, Clear Volume, which is a 3D viewer in Java. Um, really, really efficient. Um, and you know, he'd always told me like how great Java was. And I was saying, no, you should use Python. Um, and then uh, we hung out and he was like, man, you're right. Python is so good. He, he's been doing like a lot of deep learning stuff. Um, and he was like, Python is so good, but I can't look at my data. Like, uh, I really, really need a viewer. Um, and I said, well, I don't really have the knowledge to do like GUI programming, but I can tell you about all the Python and NumPy stuff. Um, so together we decided to start making a viewer. Um, the first commits were like that weekend, basically. Um, and we named it after Napari, which is this little, well, it's actually a village on the island, but we didn't know that at the time. So let's just say it's the island. Um, that is the geographical median between San Francisco and Melbourne. Um, so that's what the Napari name comes from. Um, so if you want to hear more about this whole story, um, I did a blog post, which you can find the link there. Um, and it's held up pretty well. Um, all of the fundamentals of Napari actually haven't changed since, since we started it. Um, okay, so with that, I'm going to go and switch to what Napari can do in Python. Okay, so we import this. 
Uh, I'm just going to load an image, and it's a pretty big image. So it's 10,000 pixels by 10,000 pixels by uh, four channels. Um, and then I'm going to try to show it with Matplotlib, which is, again, what, what we were using uh, before Napari, and, and basically what you should use now anyway, uh, if, you're, if you're doing plotting. Um, so there's the image, and I can zoom in, and you can see it's fine. But it's kind of a little slow. You're getting a little timer thing there. Um, and it's just not that easy to navigate. And I'm dragging. All right, it's not very smooth. Um, so if you're looking at images, Napari already gives you something, even if they're 2D only images. Uh, and it gives you the fact that it's a nice uh, OpenGL canvas, uh, which should launch at some point. There it is. Um, and this is now really fast and smooth, and uh, you can really browse your images very quickly uh, and look at any part of the image uh, multiple times uh, and, and just very quickly. Um, so that's the first thing is this uh, OpenGL canvas, which is very fast and very smooth to interact with. And maybe Zoom and my screen sharing is not showing how smooth it is, but if you have it on your machine, you'll be able to test it out. Um, but then it's also multidimensional, and that's where uh, it really changed the game uh, in Python. So this is a demo data set uh, from Scikit-Image. Um, it was provided by the Ellen Institute, so you can look at the doc string for this method. Um, and it tells us that it's 60 by 2 by 256, uh, UN16 data. Um, it tells us the scaling factors in microns. Um, and uh, it tells us that the order is uh z c y x okay so now if i try to im show this image uh matplotlib can't do anything um so uh it tells you invalid shape and there's probably a lot of people here who have put their name in a form and it said it's an invalid name because it's got a tilde or whatever um, so it's kind of annoying right um, so this is actually a valid image, uh, and with Napari, you can do image show. You tell it what the channel axis is, which we saw in the um, uh, metadata and the scale, and then Napari will nope, Napari will pop up and show you the data. And now what's happened is that it gives me a 2D canvas and a slider for the third dimension, and I can move around the slider and look at different parts of the image. Or you can click on the 3D view button here. Um, and now you have a 3D, it, it removes the slider and you have a 3D view of the data. And you can right click on this to change the, give a bit of perspective projection, which makes it look nicer depending on the data set. So the next thing that I wanna show is um, that Zar, uh, sorry, that Napari is lazy. Um, so just to go back to this other viewer, you see that every slice is quite small. And when I move around, Napari will actually not load up the image into the GPU until you move the slider to that position. And in some circumstances, it won't even load the image into RAM. Um, so I'm going to order here, uh, I'm going to open here a very large image. This is 213 gigabytes. Um, and this image is uh, in the form of a czar array. Um, and it's chunked. So that means that. Whenever we load part of the image, we are actually loading chunks that have this shape uh, from disk. Um, and now if I do napari.im show this thing, um, first of all, you'll notice that it's a four dimensional image because it has time z, y, x. Um, and so you have a 2D canvas and two sliders because there's two extra dimensions. Uh, I'm gonna adjust the contrast. Um, and now I can move around and you can see, well, again, over Zoom, it might not be obvious, but it's a little bit slower. And that's because every time I move the slider, it's going and loading some data from disk. Um, but the nice thing is I can really explore the full data set, uh, 200 gigs uh, using Napari because it's loading it uh, from disk every time that I move the slider. Um, and I can turn this into 3D. And this is a pretty big image, it's about uh yeah two gigs per time point so you can see that it's struggling a little bit to move the data and if i want to go to a different time point it takes a while because it's loading two gigabytes from disk over that time 
Um, but I can still look at it, which is nice. Um, so over here, what I want to show is that Napari, you can interact with Napari uh, back and forth with the notebook between Python and Napari. So that's that's one of the big selling points is that you can really um, you know, work in Python and look at things in Napari and go back and forth uh, very seamlessly. So there's my contrast limits right now. I can set them here and they will instantly be adjusted uh, in the viewer as I, as I set them. And I can set the color map and that instantly gets adjusted in the viewer. Okay, um, but now we might wanna do something about how slow it is for big data. Um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna open these two other images and actually I'm gonna split this particular cell and it split cell. Okay, so these are actually down sampled versions of the image that you're seeing. So if I look at um, image one dot shape, you can see that it's much smaller, <clears throat> excuse me, much smaller than this first one. So it's gone down from two gigs to one eighth of that. And then I can look at image two dot shape. Um, and that's another factor of two along every axis uh, reduced. So this is not very small. This is, uh, I'm not even gonna say how big. Um, and so in Napari, when you add uh, a list of images instead of a single image and they are decreasing in size, Napari will interpret that to be uh, a multi-scale image um, and it will make use of that when it's rendering it. So I can, uh, and I'm deleting the, the other image up here. Um, so actually I'll split that just so you can see what happens, that everything happens uh, as soon as I do it in Python. So deleted that layer. Um, and now I've added my multi-scale data and the auto contrast is a bit broken. Oh, because I'm in 3D. Let's go back to 2D. Oh, that's even more broken. Yes. Okay. There you go. It's gone. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So um so now we've we've loaded the multi-scale data and it looks basically the same, but actually if you look at the bottom left of the status, um, it says one, 661. That means that it's resolution level one. And if I zoom in, it loads the highest resolution. So this is resolution level one, resolution level zero, which is the highest resolution. And if you zoom out, it'll be resolution level two. So it's only loading as much as you need uh, based on the pixels in, in your screen. Um, if you do 3D right now, all it's doing is it's loading the um, lowest resolution um, image um, out of all of the resolution levels. But you can see that it's much smoother. Oh, well, again, it's, it's hard to see maybe through the zoom, but it is much smoother to interact because it's, it's moving a lot fewer pixels. Um, and if I want to slide around, let me just go here, uh, I can very smoothly go through the whole data set. So this is a really nice way. And in 3D, um, you know, because you're doing the full data set, then one eighth of that, so that's 12%, then one eighth of that again, so that's 12% of 12%. Um, having a multi-scale pyramid does not actually re increase the amount of data that you have to store on disk um, very much at all. So it's a very nice way to have your data and be able to look at all of it um, very smoothly. Um, okay, so the next thing that I want to show is that Napari has layers. So we've seen now uh, two things. Uh, one is that you can display multidimensional images, and we also saw that you can display two channels together. Uh, so they're called image layers. Um, but I'm going to close this. Uh, and there's actually lots of different layer types that you can um, put in Apari. Uh, so this is a demo from Alistair Burt, who's an Apari core developer. Uh, who He works in CryAM data. Uh, and you can see that this layer has an image, uh, which is the a tomogram, uh, so from uh, cryo-electron tomography. Um, 
and it has points. And these are the particles that are being detected by um, the algorithm. Uh, so they're individual proteins that, that the cryo ET processing has identified. Uh, and vectors which show you the orientation of the particle. So I can zoom in here and, and uh, by the way, I understand nothing of the algorithms to how they can see anything here. Um, but you can see that it's correctly identified particles all around this particular HIV uh, capsid. Um, and I can um, display out of slice vectors and out of slice points to show uh, that there's points being identified on the surface and there's sort of uh, all of the particles are pointing out. So these are HIV capsid particles. Um, and if I zoom out, uh, I can see, sorry, if I zoom out, if I switch to 3D, I can see that uh, essentially all of the HIV particles have been, oops, correctly identified. Uh, and um, yeah, are pointing where you expect them to point. Um, so in this way, Napari lets you um, take your automated algorithm and make sure that um, everything is as you expect. So it, it helps you iterate when you're processing images and, and understand what you're doing right or wrong um, as, you, as you look at them. Um, another type of layer that you can see is um, surface layers. Um, so for people working with um, brain data, this would be very common. This is actually uh, a data set um, from uh, Emmanuel Veno from University College Dublin um, showing corals in 3D. So this is uh, a 3D scanned coral and you can yeah, have a look at it and um, yeah, just look at your uh, 3D scan samples um, in Napari. Uh, and as far as I understand from Emmanuel, Napari is one of the few softwares that can show both um, surface data and volumetric data uh, in the same space. Um, which is very nice. Um, okay, so we're going to see one more layer type, and that is the segmentation layer. Um, so I'll talk about this more uh, on Wednesday. Um, this is actually like a, a speed run of the exercises you're going to do Wednesday, so don't pay too close attention. Um, okay, so we're going back to the cells data set. Uh, this is the cells data. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to try to find all the nuclei. Um, so I'm just normalizing the data, detecting some edges. So this is now the edges of the nuclei. Um, so you can see that there's structure inside the nuclei, but around the nuclei, there's a nice solid edge. Um, and then we're going to try to find each nucleus and separate it using a watershed algorithm, which again, I'm not going to go into today, but we will go into it um, on Wednesday. Okay, so right now all I've done is I've looked at the um, places where the foreground was higher than the background, um, and I've looked at the blobs that were connected. And you can see that it mostly does a good job of segmenting uh, out nuclei, um, but some of them are merged. So these three, these two, and these two, and this is a nucleus undergoing mitosis. You can argue that it's merged here. Um, so we want to split them. And by the way, this is now the final layer type that I wanted to show, which is the labels layer, um, which is uh, another way of saying segmentation. So it, it puts a different value on each segment and then colors them with random colors. So I can look at it in 3D. You can see um, these three segments have merged, these segments have merged, and these two segments have merged. Now you can sort of spend a lot of time tuning parameters to try to segment this. Um, so this is kind of, this was crowdsourced uh, at a previous tutorial. Um, how do we find points um, within uh, each, where's my points layer? There it is. Um, trying to find one point within each nucleus. And you can see that it's done a really good job. Um, there's points in almost every nucleus, um, but there's some missing. Right, and so you can basically spend a lot of time, a long, long time, um, trying to tweak the parameters, and then they they'll work for this image, but they won't work for another image. Um, what Napari allows you to do is to um, again go back and forth between the Python and fix the errors whenever uh, you see any. So you you get a good enough solution, and then you do a little bit of manual editing, and you can get 
a, a perfect segmentation for your data. Um, so we're going to do that now. So what I'm going to do is, um, again, let me uh, add a cell here. Um, so if I do points, this is my points layer. These are all the points that we've added uh, automatically. And now I'm going to go here. I'm going to switch to add mode and do 2D view and show out of slice points. Yep. OK, so these, we were missing this nucleus. So I'm going to add a point here, and this one, and this one. OK, so now we go back to 3D. And you can see now we have all of the points, which will allow us to segment the nuclei. And so what uh, Napari has done now is it's replaced the data with the data that we've added. So these are all the points that we had there before, and we've also added these three points. So we can just grab the points data, which we've done here, and then keep going with our uh, Python processing. So now I'm going to do a watershed based on those points. And that is the watershed segmentation. So you can see we've correctly segmented these. This one is mostly correct. These have not segmented properly. So we can investigate and go in 2D. Uh, and you can see that there was a seed here, but watershed's not a perfect algorithm. So it's actually this, this segment has overrun this one, just like it's overrun here a bit. Um, so what are we going to do? I'm going to pick this value. Uh, then I'm going to switch to 3D mode. And then I'm going to separate the two nuclei. So I've got an eraser. I've got a brush. Oh, that's not working. Yeah. So I'm going to try to split the nuclei. Let's say around here. And you can do this in 3D. So you can be, again, depending on your data, because sometimes the problem is not that it's 3D, but it's that you have way too much stuff obstructing your view. But now I've separated the two nuclei. Uh, let me double check that. Oh, is it separate? I think it's separate. So now I've got the the ID of the segment that's inside here, and I'm just going to fill in three dimensions. There you go. So that is the nucleus segmented. Um, we might as well do this other one over here. Let's find a good angle to split them. Grab our eraser, erase in 3D. If any of you play Minecraft, then this will be very familiar. Um, so I can now pick the color of the nucleus that I want and fill in three dimensions over here. So yeah, with Napari, we've combined um, some algorithms um, together with uh, some manual annotation to get a, a nice segmentation very quickly. So that's um, one of the powerful things that I really like uh, Napari for. Um, the last bit, there's actually a bug right now. Um, so it's going to be underwhelming, but I will show you anyway. Um, so remember we had our image, uh, which was a very large image, um, uh, two gigabytes. Um, but it's stored in ZAR, and ZAR is an array that uh, lives on disk, uh, and Napari sort of transparently uh, can view. Um, but Napari can also write into ZAR arrays. And so what we're going to do is we're going to make a ZAR array for some segmentations, and then we're going to write into it. So that's what I'm doing here. This makes a ZAR array at this location, um, which has the same shape as my image. Um, and you type UN32, and this is important, it won't write any empty chunks. So any data that is zero in on disk will not be written out. So it'll just be virtual. Um, so here's my viewer. Uh, still bad contrast. There you go. Um, and it's got um, the image. Um, and I'm going to show you what's in that directory. So I've got, this is the image that we've loaded. And there's a, a directory now, 01 labels are. And if I look inside that directory, I see that the only thing there is a dog set array, which tells the computer that this is a ZAR array. Um, labels has this shape, and I can add it to the viewer. So now there's a labels layer 
on top of my image layer and I can go to three dimensions find a nucleus and let's go and paint so let me make this a little bit bigger a bit bigger okay so I want to let's do a bit more paint this nucleus okay and so that's the thing that's a bug so now I have to like refresh to show it um but there it is. This will be fixed uh, very shortly. Um, but you can see that I've painted into the Zara Ray and I've painted a 3D blob. Um, Zara Ray is a you know, multi gigabyte volume, um, but we've just written a little bit onto the disk. Uh, and if I show you the same directory that we showed before, you can see now that there's a directory, another directory under it. Or that specific chunk where we've written some data. Um, this is another powerful thing that you can do with Napari, which is to paint into very big arrays. Um, yeah, bigger than than your RAM. Um, and lastly, there's two uh, small demos. Um, the first one is to show that Napari is really one of the goals is to integrate very well with the scientific Python ecosystem. Um, so I call this Napari board. Oh no. Oh, I haven't installed this in this. Um, I should have checked that environment more closely. Uh, can I install Forge Vision this quickly? Let's have a look. I will um, skip this section for a second and go to the plugins, uh, and we'll, we'll talk more about it in the slides. Um, so this plugin that I want to show off is this Napari OMEZAR. So I showed you here. Uh, this dot OMEZAR, which if we look at it, uh, let's do this. Yeah. Uh, so it actually has three arrays inside it, zero, one, and two. Um, and so this is this is actually a data format and it has the Z adders and the Z group. So this is actually a data format that's based on Zar, um, but that includes this whole multi-dimensional, uh, multi-scale uh, data. And up here, I had to, where am I? Way up here. Here, I had to load these arrays manually one by one. Oh, there's PyTorch, very good. Oh, that's not good at all. That's okay. I'll I'll re redo the um, environment later. Uh, so I have to load them manually and then add them manually as three different layers to Napari. So it's a little bit clunky. Um, so with this format, I can install a Napari plugin um, and I can say viewer.open this particular file using this plugin and it will do everything that I did manually above. Um, automatically. So now you can see that I have the same multi-scale data that I had before, uh, and that it's very fast and smooth because it's it's loading that multi-scale. So this is called uh, a reader plugin, and there's just, for so many formats, you can find reader plugins um, for Napari. Uh, there's actually this thing, Napari PDF reader. I don't know why it exists, but it does exist, and it's beautiful. Uh, so I can do call Napari on my uh, Jupyter PDF, which is a paper. Um, and I'm going to close this. Oh, no, it died. Did I not install the Napari PDF? All right, let's try that again. And there you go. You can. This. Oh, no, no, it isn't. It's working. Is it working? I can't tell if it's working. Yes. Yes, it is. It's working very, very slowly, slower than usual. OK, so what this is is a, a deep learning network. Uh, and what's happening is that you've got some noisy input images, so these, and it's trying to um, self-learn the noise to, to denoise the images. So this is a network called noise to self. Um, so right now I'm running um, PyTorch. Uh, I'm wrapping it in a desk array so that we can display it um, because torch arrays are a bit weird. Um, and then I am 
um, showing both the input value and the output of the network uh, as it's training. So every time that you see an update, it's like another cycle of the network training and you can see the loss. So this is an embedded Matplotlib plot uh, underneath. So that's the loss over time. And you can see that the network is um, learning, you know, getting better and better. It starts random, but it's getting better and better at finding the signal in the image. And it's a bit clearer if you change the contrast a bit. Um, and you can move around your data set and see how the network is doing for different parts of your data set. Um, so again, this was just to show like that, that we make an effort to, to make it easy to use all of the scientific Python ecosystem together with Napari. Um, and I will cut the demo short because that's going to take a long while to train it. But you can see it's doing, it's doing good. All right. So back to my slides, and I think we'll be over soon. So um, one of the big things that um, I like about Napari is that it's open source and it integrates with a really wide open source ecosystem. And one of the things is uh, this uh, Python MIDI. So this is a MIDI controller, which is designed for music. Uh, and here, uh, thanks to a bunch of work of other people, um, but I was able to hook it up to the MIDI to the sliders, uh, and it goes back and forth. So you can see actually, if I move the controller, uh, it moves the slider, and if I move the slider, it changes the LEDs on the controller. Um, so I think that's pretty cool. And then the buttons are buttons to control the layers, um, and then the slider you can hook up to be the layer opacity, and then you can um, draw while you move the slider, uh, and you can just get really nice custom behaviors in open source that would be impossible to do with proprietary software. Um, so that's one of the things I really, really like about the community. Um, and then the big one is plugins. Uh, I'm sure you've heard about a lot of plugins and you will hear about more plugins during the week. Um, but plugins uh, let developers customize Napari, um, and that includes sharing their tools with, with uh, people who might not want to code as much. Um, so you can plugins can add file format, which we saw. You can add widgets, which we'll see a little bit of and which Robert uh, will talk about uh, in the next, uh, in this afternoon, I think. Um, you can also provide sample data sets, um, and you can change the look of, of Napari. And there's there's more stuff coming. We just haven't done it yet, but um, you'll be able to add menus, add buttons, um, that sort of stuff. Um, so doing a plugin is quite easy. Uh, you need a Napari.yaml, which describes um, what is uh, what contributions the plugin provides, uh, and a Napari.manifest uh, point that tells you where tells Python where the Napari.yaml lives. Um, and then you can add a classifier to your package that makes um, people more easily discover your plugin. Uh, so here's a few plugins that people have done. Um, the first one, uh, this one's an annotation plugin from Walter Michiel, um, who's now an Apari core developer. Um, and um, just like a very nice 2D annotation software for very large files. Um, this one's from um, Lara Zigut, right? I don't actually know how to pronounce her name, uh, and uh, the rest of, of Robert's group. Uh, this is probably my favorite plugin out there uh, in that it really shows what I was talking about with um, integrating the whole ecosystem. Um, so this, this has matplotlib for that plot. It's got obviously Napari on the left, um, and it's using scikit-learn um, to do that, the clustering and so on. Um, so it's really, really nice uh, demo of the power of, of scientific Python. Um, and this one, again, someone I've never met before, um, and um, showing how you can draw in three dimensions by drawing a line which defines uh, a two-dimensional manifold, then rotating the view and drawing another line which now defines a line in 3D. Um, so this is, yeah, no, 3D filament annotator, super cool. Um, and that brings me to the community, which is uh, really the best thing. And we're, we're trying to expand it by, by doing this workshop. Um, but um, the Napari community has been really amazing. Um, this is from a survey that CZI ran um, late last year. 
Um, almost 90% of people agree and 81% strongly agree that the Napari community is open and welcoming. So again, please join us. Um, the, uh, and, and this is just how many people have contributed directly to the Napari code base over time. So you can see it's um, a lot of people, um, which is amazing. Um, one thing that we're not doing so well on is uh, this is uh, how easy it is to maintain and improve Napari. Uh, and you can see that 50% thought it was harder than expected, and it was, it was a lot harder than expected, and then a few 17% thought it was harder than expected. Um, so yeah, we're working, we're working to bring those numbers down. Uh, and we'll see, we'll see at the end of this year how that goes. Um, but nevertheless, people will agree that we're welcoming. So you should you should still come and try and we'll try to help you. Um, so this is all the core developers uh, around the world. Um, that have um, not just contributed to Napari, but contributed a lot to Napari uh, and really made it what it is today. Um, and uh, it's nice because there's just scattered across so many time zones. So whenever you have a question, you can go on our chat room or uh, image.sc uh, and typically you'll get a response very quickly because there's just so many people spread all around the world. Um, so with that, I wanna say thank you um, to all of the Napari community uh, all the contributors, plugin developers, all of our users, all of you for listening. Uh, and then CZI, who gives us a lot of support, and uh, Quonsite, um, and NumFocus. Uh, so Napari is now a NumFocus-sponsored project, which means that uh, it can receive donations, which uh, are sorely needed. Um, and if anyone has a source that could be useful, then please get in touch. Um, and as I said, please, please join us. So uh, there's a lot of help out there for, for people who want to do Napari. Like this, this uh, workshop is going to be great. Um, and hopefully you will learn a lot. But um, even outside the workshop, um, we have a, a real-time chat at napari.zulichat.com. Um, and you can go to the image.sc forum and ask questions there as well um, and report issues on our GitHub. Uh, everything is completely open. So. Um, Really nice uh, way to, um, yeah, lots of ways to get help. And that's everything.